Yeah. All right. Okay. So yeah. Um, hi, I'm Andrea Albert. I'm a physicist uh, here at Slack National Lab, and I'm chatting with uh, a class from Bristol Eastern High School. This teacher is Mary Hyde, who was um, my science teacher in eighth grade. So hi, Bristol Eastern. Hi. How are you guys? I, I wore my uh, Adam earrings for you guys. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I want a pair of Adam earrings. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah, these are a Christmas present from some friends of mine who know me well. <laughs> Very good. Um, why don't you go ahead and give these guys a little bit of your background, and then they have several questions for you. Right. Okay. So... So yeah, I kind of uh, I spent middle school and high school in Bristol, Connecticut. So I think my dad was in the Air Force, so we moved around a lot. But Bristol's where I spent probably the longest chunk of time. So it's probably as close to a home as I as I have. Uh, I went to Chippens Hill Middle School, and I was on the purple team in eighth grade. So I got Mrs. Hyde as my as my science teacher. Uh, she really inspired me. Uh, and then I went on to do high school at Miss Porter's school. Although I would have gone to Eastern. Um, I was in Eastern's district, and uh, I just again loved science. Uh, I was really encouraged, um, and I ended up going to Rice University in Houston, Texas, for college. Um, and there, I got involved in research right away. And I realized that like I liked the classroom work. Uh, it's really important to get your foundational uh, knowledge, um, get the terminology, and learn the math skills you're going to need. But uh, I love doing the research. Or you were discovering things for the first time, and you weren't just you weren't able to look up the answer in the back of the book. It wasn't there yet. You were the one who was writing the answer for the very first time, and I thought that was really cool. And I kind of jumped around between different research projects, and I eventually figured out that I sort of like this hybrid between astrophysics, where you're looking um, at stuff from the universe and the stars, and then particle physics. Uh, where you're looking at the really tiny fundamental pieces of the universe and the forces of the universe. And so thankfully, uh, there is this field now called astroparticle physics, uh, which I guess I would consider myself an astroparticle physicist. Uh, and so I went to Ohio State for my graduate school to do my PhD thesis, because at Ohio State, they had this thing called CCAP, which is the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics. And I wanted to do experimental work on an astroparticle experiment. And at Ohio State, I had choices. They were on several experiments that I would have been interested in, um, which was really important because if I if, uh, if had started working with someone and it didn't really work out, like the personalities didn't get along too well, then I would have been able to switch to another group easily and still worked on astroparticle physics. And so thankfully, the group I started with, uh, we had a really good connection. And so I kept going with them. I worked with Brian Weiner and Richard Hughes, who are particle physicists. But they're also astrophysicists, so perfect. And we worked on the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which I have a little model of. So this is Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Space Telescope. It's uh, 550 kilometers up, so it's in a low Earth orbit. Um, so unfortunately, I cannot show it you the actual detector, but I have this little model. Um, I can tell you more about that if you're interested. And yeah, so I just got my PhD in May, and then I got a postdoc here at Slack National Lab, uh, continuing to work on Fermi, but also working on the development of an upcoming gamma ray uh, experiment called CTA. Uh, I also I have an awesome husband um, and two cats, and I like to do jazzercise. And uh, in college, I also studied Tibetan Buddhism uh, quite extensively. So those are other non-science things about me. See, she's normal, guys. <laughs> I'll do this, all of you. So who has the first question? All right, so Dr. Albert, did you know in high school that you wanted to major in science? Yeah, I did. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, I think one of my earliest and kind of most pronounced memories of when I just felt really inspired for the first time came from Mrs. Hyde. I'm not, and I swear to God, this is I like I, I would tell anyone this. I'm not just saying it because I'm talking to her class. Um, but she she did these experiments for us on Halloween, and she dressed up. She got all dressed up, and she decorated up her classroom. It was kind of like a witch's lair, 
Uh, and she did all these really cool experiments with like a Van de Graaff generator and um, sodium and water and uh, at some point she had a hovercraft. I think that was uh, not a Halloween thing, um, but then different chemical reactions. And it wasn't just a wow factor. She was also saying, you know, this stuff's cool, right? And we are going to learn why this happens. And I was like, oh, we know why this happens? Really? Wow, we can like, we can describe, we understand this? I thought that was amazing. And I was like, I want to know why that happened. Yeah, please tell me. Tell me right now. I'll stay after school. I'll just, just let me know. Um, and so then you go and you learn about, you know, all the little interactions between atoms and like their electron structures and how that's going to really govern a lot of these um, these things that you see. And in high school, I loved my chemistry class. I even I, I loved my calculus class because you, you gotta you gotta do calculus if you want to be a physicist. Um, but it really is a, a cool. Uh, it's a much different way of thinking about math than say in algebra where you're just maybe solving an equation for x. Um, in calculus you start breaking things down into like infinitesimally like, small pieces and adding them together and doing intervals and differential equations and that that's really, I liked that um, and I really liked physics, I liked astronomy and so yeah I knew I knew in middle school that that I, I loved science. All right, thank you. Question two. What was your major in high school or in college? Yeah, so in college I double majored in astrophysics and uh, religious studies. And so the astrophysics was a little different from just the straight up physics degree. Um, you had to take like an astro lab course where I got to go out and play with some telescopes and look and you know, look at the stars. I remember one of our assignments was to look at Venus and you know draw a picture of it and that during the time of the lab Venus did not rise until 4 a.m. So in order to do this assignment uh, you know, I went to bed and then me and my lab partner we got up at 4 a.m. and I remember our, uh, our dorm like our RAs I don't know why they were up at 4 a.m. but later that morning they're like, "What were you doing? <laughs> like, why were you walking around at 4 a.m.?" It's like I had to go see Venus. I'm sorry, it was class class assignment, uh, but we're cool. Anyway, so um, and then also I took um, some astrophysics classes like um, cosmology and <laughs> the, the stellar physics class was really hard. Um, if you try to, if you start to think about how all the energy in the center of a star propagates out as your environment's changing and the densities and the temperatures are changing, this it's a very, very complicated problem that uh, took an entire cl entire semester's class to sort of start to scratch the surface on. Um, and so then, yeah, and then I also double majored in religious studies because I, I had to take a general credit class, uh, and religious studies was an easy A. So I was like, all right, that sounds great, easy A. I like that. Um, and I fell in love with uh, Buddhism like, and also some other Eastern religions like Taoism and Hinduism. There were some philosophical themes that overlapped with um, physics, like this idea of dualism and superposition. So, you know, Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat being like alive and dead at the same time. Um, you know, they kind of have this idea in, in Zen Buddhism of, uh, how do they say it, not one or two, but one and two. Anyway, so uh, there was there there is an overlap there, I, I promise. Uh, and my Buddhism professor was really great, and she was very understanding that science came first for me, and so she helped me, uh, encouraged me to get the double major, and helped me fit that in with my schedule. And so I'm really glad I did that. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, that was a long answer. Uh, <laughs> did it? Did I answer it? it no. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. When did you decide to become an astrophysicist? Yeah, um, it's kind of funny. I can't really pinpoint the day that I became an astrophysicist. Um, it just one day. I, I guess even now, I think like, oh yeah, I'm an astro. You know, I'm typing for my little thing on the corner here in my video. I'm like, oh yeah, I I'm an astrophysicist, huh? Well, look at that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's kind of like um, you know, you guys are all growing up, and you say, "Well, when did you become an adult?" And you just you can't really pinpoint a time. It just someday you're just like, "Huh, all right, well, very good." Um, but I guess I I wanted to be 
I kind of, so I've never really been, I've always had kind of a, a general idea of what I'd like to do with my life, but especially with um, kind of an astrophysics field and even an academic field, things are just really uncertain and always changing. You know, what, what jobs are going to be available is very, uh, is variable depending on when you're applying. You know, you, you, so if you have like a specific school you want to go to or like a specific group you want to work with, um, that you're going to make things a little bit more difficult for yourself. And so, you know, you kind of learn to just sort of go with the flow and kind of take things one step at a time. And so that's kind of, that's what I did in college is, uh, I remember I was going to take the intro astronomy course for my major and I went into the class and I realized that I looked at the syllabus and I listened to the first lecture and I was like, I already know pretty much all of this because I'd studied it on my own, I'd studied it in high school. So I, and my friends in high school kind of made fun of me for this. It was maybe uh, a little um, ballsy. But anyway, I went to the professor and I asked if I could TA the class because I was like, I already know all this. Can I just TA your class? And he said, no, I really don't want a sophomore. Um, you know, I, the TA spots are usually for the graduate students because they need the, the support with the funding. And I totally get that. And he's like, but do you want to do research for me? I was like, yeah. Awesome, let's do research. So I ended up doing that instead, and I worked on a dark matter experiment called Xenon 10 and studying a detector piece called the multiplier tube. And uh, I thought that was cool, but then I was like, then I took my lab course, and I was like, oh, telescopes are sweet. I like looking at stars. Maybe I want to be an observational astronomer. So I went and I did a little bit of that with another one of my professors. And then I realized, well, I don't know, those problems are cool, but, you know, they're not really staying up at night thinking about what makes stars burn. And then I had my particle physics professor, he said, hey, you should go talk with um, this other Marge Corcoran. She's been on sabbaticals. So sabbaticals when you take a year off as a professor to go do whatever you want. And you don't have to teach. So she wasn't at Rice, and I never met her. He's like, you should go introduce yourself and see if she maybe has like a particle physics research topic for you. Um, because you seem to be pretty interested in particle physics. So I just walked over to her office. I'm like, hey, you don't know me, uh, but I think I might want to work on a particle physics project this summer. Uh, can you hook me up? And she managed to get me an internship at Fermilab, which is um, where the, the US uh, proton collider was. Well, it's turned off now. I guess it's the, the, the tunnel's still there, but they don't, they don't do any collisions anymore called the Tevatron. I did not work on that. I worked on a neutrino experiment, but I was like, oh man, particle physics is awesome. So that's when I was like, okay, I definitely want to do astro and particle. Uh, and so then that helped when I was looking at grad schools. It helped narrow down the search. Um, again, sorry, I, that was a really long long answer. Uh, was that? Did that's okay. It's informative. It's good for them to know all the different directions you went in. Right, but yeah, if you know, if, if you get any follow-up questions, you know, just just lay them on me, like, you know, feel free to speak up. <laughs> what exactly is gravity? Gravity. Gravity. That is a really good question because I think gravity is the fundamental force that we have the fuzziest picture of, um, and. So there's maybe two different ways of thinking about it. So it's clearly uh, just based on observational evidence it's an attractive force. So kind of like, you know, you get two magnets, they're attracted to each other. So gravity is an attractive force um, between massive objects. Its strength falls off as 1 over r squared. So the further away you are, the less uh, strength of the force um, is affecting you. And so you can think of this that, that way. And then if you want to try to think of um, it in terms of the other forces, which I think is another question that might be coming up. Um, so maybe I shouldn't jump ahead. But for the electromagnetic, the weak, and the strong forces, we can describe that as uh, exchanging a virtual particle. So for, electromagnet for electromagnetism, the force there is being, as we say, mediated by exchanging a photon. So the photon is the carrier particle of that force. And for a weak force, it's the W and the Z bosons. And for a strong force, it's a gluon. Um, but if you think of gravity as like, you know, the force being some exchange of a particle, you know, uh, I guess people have talked about a graviton. Uh, hypothetically, it's never been detected yet, but we can look for it. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to describe gravity in that picture. Uh, Einstein, with general relativity, kind of gave us a different way to think of gravity where he said space and time are 
you know, merge together. They're the they're not separate entities. They are one thing, one fabric of space time. And massive things will distort the space time. So you can think of a trampoline or a rubber sheet. And when you stand on the trampoline, you know, it dips down. And then you say that all objects are forced to exist. You know, they can't go off of the trampoline surface. So it's like a little ant or something on the trampoline surface. You know, he can't he can't get off of that. Um, so he has to travel along the curves that the massive thing has created for him. And that you can actually think of gravity as you get stuck in these little curves. Um, and you're not going to be losing energy, so you just kind of keep going around and around and around. Um, so there's that picture. I think there's a cool YouTube video. Um, of a guy who has this demo where he gets this big rubber sheet and these little marbles and he can kind of get um, some different orbital interactions pieces so he can get like two marbles that end up like orbiting each other when he has this big massive thing distorting uh, the rubber sheet like mass distorts space time. Um, I should probably look that up and maybe I can send it to you guys. Um, but yeah, gravity is is a tough one So and there's still lots of work that needs to be done on it. So if it's something you're interested in you know, there's there's work to be done there. We definitely need some new new ideas. How gravity really is. Yep. Uh, who's next? What are the main forces of living gravity? Oh, okay, yeah, good. So yeah, I already kind of briefly talked about those, but yeah, we've got uh, electromagnetism. So fun fact, back in the 1800s, with when uh, people were discovering like electrons for the very first time, you know, you've probably heard of J.J. Thompson's uh, cathode ray tube, maybe, um, or this guy Maxwell. But you know, you see these electro forces where you have like a current, and then you see these magnetic forces, right, where things are maybe attracted. And at first, you think, oh, those are two different things. But then you go and you say, oh, when I have a current. It makes a magnetic field that like makes this sort of attractive repulsive force that I saw. So you know these two things are are like the same. You know I think a story I heard was that there was an experiment someone was doing, which is probably not very safe, uh, with lightning. So not Benjamin Franklin, but um, I want to say Maxwell, but don't quote me on that. Um, and he had a compass, which obviously aligns with magnetic fields, like the Earth's magnetic field. And when the lightning struck nearby, the compass would like go crazy and spin around. And so that was kind of a, a hint that this this current, this electro current, was also creating a magnetic field that was affecting the compass. Um, and so this idea of these two forces that you originally maybe think are separate are actually the same force. They're just sort of different um, manifestations of the same force. So we have electromagnetism. And like I said, that's a we can now, if you want to think of it in like very small particle by particle interaction uh, scales, it's an uh, exchanging a virtual photon is what we say. Uh, the other forces are the weak force. Weak force governs nuclear decay, so neutron eh, neutron can decay to a proton, and that's happening because um, it is exchanging stuff called a, a W boson or a Z boson. So with the weak force and thinking of it as an exchanging of these particles, then that predicted the W and the Z particles existing. And so those were predicted, and then they were discovered. Uh, so that was a you know, big success of the theory. And something else that we were able to do is say, well, just like electricity and magnetism could come together as one, the weak force and electromagnetism can come together as one at high enough energies. And so we call that the electroweak force. And so another fun fact is, People will think that the Large Hadron Collider, so the big proton smasher in Switzerland, that that was looking for the Higgs, and that was one of the one of the things we're looking there. But that energy scale is interesting for another reason. Uh, that energy scale is where we where what we call electroweak symmetry breaking occurs, and so that's just kind of the fancy physics way of saying at higher energies, the electromagnetic force and the weak force look exactly the same. They're the, the same force, but then you get at lower energies and they start to act differently. And so the symmetry uh, is broken, and the energy where the LHC is is right around the electro uh, weak symmetry breaking energy scale, which is where we expected the Higgs to be. So, and we found it! Yay! That that was really good. Um, and so the next force is 
a strong force, and this is what holds atomic nuclei together. So right, you can think of like, you know, you, you get like two positive magnets and you try to put them together, they really, really don't like that. And so like you think of your nucleus, your nucleus is really dense. You know, the, the size of a nucleus compared to the rest of the atom is like a fly in a football field. So like it is packed tight and you've got all these protons. So like how do we get all of these protons to agree to be able to be that close to each other when they're um, repelling each other because they're both positively charged? Well, the strong force, strong force is what helps us do that. Um, and the mediator particle for that is called a gluon. Um, and then I think at even higher energies, you could imagine um, the strong force coming together with the electroweak force. And so this all kind of exists consistently. And then we've got gravity. And we haven't really figured out how to get gravity to work in with these other forces in the way that we think about them as an exchange of a particle and kind of coming together as one force. And so coming up with uh, what they call a grand unified theory, or a uh, gut, uh, is kind of a holy grail in theoretical physics. So another problem that, if you're interested in it, can study up and help us solve it. Um, so yeah, those are the fundamental forces. They're really interesting, guys, because all of those seem to be connected in some way. So when we talk about the nucleus, and we're talking about the neutron, proton, and electron, they're all exchanging these forces. That's all there. It's all part of that. So where do we go from there? How do we really discover what that is? There. And that's what Andrea's after. She's after that unknown. So next question. Uh, my question is, what is dark matter, and how can you try to understand it? Yeah, so dark matter, um, there's really not much we know about it, but we know it's there. So maybe that's the easier uh, question to answer. Uh, what it is, ugh, but uh, how do we know it's there? OK, yeah, I can do that one. So um, we can look at, ooh. Ah, very good. No problem. OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so we look at these objects in the in the universe. So we, let, let's take a galaxy or a galaxy cluster. Um, galaxies, maybe. Let, let's start small. Um, so we have all these stars, and they're all bound together by gravity, right, to form a galaxy. So they're not flying off and doing their own thing. They're kind of one system, and they're all rotating together, and they're all being held together by this gravitational glue. And we can say, all right. Well, I have this thing in physics, and if you keep going in physics, you will definitely learn this many, many times. It's something called the virial theorem. The virial theorem says that if you have a gravitationally bound system, the kinetic energy of each piece in that has to be um, a certain amount. It can't be more than this, because if the kinetic energy of these objects was uh, larger, like they, would be, they wouldn't be part of this whole system, right? They'd be flying off and doing their own thing. It'd be like a rogue star that just says, you know, screw you guys, I'm... I'm going to go this way. I'm not going to be rotating in this circle anymore. Um, and so we can look at the, uh, the energy or how fast the stars are moving um, at the very center of the galaxy and at the very edge of the galaxy. And what we see is the stars at the edge of the galaxy are moving so fast that there has to be more gravity holding the whole thing together than just the gravity that we see from normal matter like stars. And so, and it has to be like a hundred times more gravity. I mean, this isn't like a little 10% correction. This is order of magnitude or more mass is needed in order to keep everything gravitationally glued together. So that's really what, what we think of as dark matter. And uh, we call it dark because we cannot see it. So right, we can see the stars. They shine. They emit light. They emit um, photons. We can detect those photons. Awesome. Uh, dark matter doesn't really uh, do that quite as, as often. Um, every once in a while, they might interact um, and give you something called a gamma ray, which is a very high energy photon, which is what I'm looking for. But we haven't seen that yet. That's, that's still just a theory. Um, and right, so that's how we know dark matter is there. Um, we're pretty sure that it's a particle. So someone thought, well, maybe the dark matter is just um, maybe some like neutron stars or black holes or just you know some some of these really dense objects that are made out of normal matter, but they just don't shine as much as stars do. And so those are things called machos, uh, massive. So that's the M A 
compact halo objects, matches. Uh, and we can look for those, and we have looked through those by saying, okay, uh, I know that massive things are going to distort space-time, so they're going to make a warp like we saw in uh, the trampoline analogy. And so that means that if there's a massive object between my face and you guys, the light is going to kind of bend around it. And get and the the massive object is actually going to act a little bit like a lens. And so as the uh, objects pass in front of each other in your field of view, it's going to cause the background object to get a little bit brighter. And so there were lots of studies in the 90s looking for this effect, and they saw they didn't see as much as they needed to explain all of the missing matter. And so that's where people started talking about particles. And so now we have WIMPs, which I think was inspired by the Macho's name. So WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles. So we look for those, but uh, we haven't really seen them yet. We expect them to maybe uh, give us a small gamma ray signal. Uh, they might, every once in a while, come and whack into a nucleus in one of these uh, detectors that are underground. That would, uh, that would see maybe a handful of events a year. <laughs> so not very, not, they're very, very hard to detect. Um, or we might make them at some place like the LHC, and then they wouldn't interact, and so we'd see them as, we know energy has to be conserved, so we'd measure all the other energy of the particles, and we'd say, oh, we're missing some. And so, and it's kind of a common theme, right? So we say, okay, we're missing some mass. All right, it's got to be from the dark matter. Um, so does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah? Awesome. Okay. So uh, how was dark matter discovered? Yeah, so I kind of touched on um, the looking at the stellar rotation curves is what they're called, so looking at the velocity of the stars um, as a function of distance from the, from the center of the galaxy. Um, uh, another big piece of evidence came from something called the bullet cluster. So we have two galaxy clusters, and they have merged, and they have in a very geometrically favorable position in the sky. So the merger happened right in the plane of the sky. So they weren't like at an angle where it would have been much harder to understand what's going on. Right. So everything in space, it's you kind of only get a 2D projection of this three. So like the angle where they're at, you know, it kind of makes things difficult to understand what's going on uh, if you don't know the intrinsic shape. Uh, but anyway, so this merger happened right, you know, face on. And so these guys went through each other and what we saw is all the normal matter got stuck in the middle, but all of the mass just went right on through and didn't interact much at all. And so that's telling us that the, the matter that's responsible for the mass is separate from the normal matter that got all mixed up in the middle and that it also it doesn't interact very much. Um, and so that was kind of some of the, one of the biggest pieces of evidence for uh, dark matter being separate from normal matter and uh, being a particle that doesn't really interact all that much. Uh, we can also look at something called the CMB. Oh, and I have, I have, oh, beach ball. All right, get to use my beach ball. So I got one of these. This is um, the CMB. So what this, what that, what is that? It's cosmic microwave background. Radiation. So these are photons that are the oldest photons we could possibly detect. They escaped from the dense soup of the universe 300,000 years after the Big Bang, and they traveled all the way to our detector, and then we can detect them and figure out um, how their energies vary on very small scales. And so that's what this is showing. It's showing how the temperatures are changing. Uh, red is hotter and blue is colder. And the, the changes we're talking about are something like 10 to the negative 4, so 0 0.0001 Kelvin. Uh, so very, you know, this is a very sensitive detector. You know, we're not talking huge changes in temperature. You probably not even notice. Uh, the bright thing here is from the galactic plane. So this, typically you'll see this map and the galactic plane has been subtracted. But if you look at off of the galactic plane, so these are coming from outside of our galaxy, these fluctuations, and the scale, the, the, yeah, the spatial scale, so you can see that these things are fluctuating, uh, they look like it's pretty much the same in all directions, and they're fluctuating on very small angular scales, and the, the size of that scale 
tells you about how much matter there had to be in the early universe. So the idea is that if you had a lot of matter, it would make this little pocket uh, in space-time where things would you know, get gravitationally collected in, and that pocket would become a little bit hotter than another place that maybe didn't have this matter pocket. And so you can figure out how, much, how many of these little pockets you needed and how they're spatially distributed and, and sort of assume and figure out how much matter you needed. And this is really the measurement, and, and I know it's a little bit uh, more abstract, um, but this is the measurement that's telling us how much of the universe is made out of matter and made out of dark matter is by looking at these little temperature variations of the CMB. Uh, and so that is another really strong, so the CMB we're saying, well, if we need to have all, we need to have this extra matter than the normal matter. We need to have dark matter in order to get the kind of variations that we are seeing uh, in the cosmic microwave background. So, yeah, I know that last one, it's a hard one to explain. I haven't found the perfect uh, analogies yet. But it's really interesting uh, and something that we also has lots, lots of unanswered questions. Lots of work to do. Does dark matter affect the Earth or no? Not very much. Um, so dark matter, we say, we believe the local uh, amount of dark matter is, well, in in physicists' world, we would say it's 0.4 GeV per centimeter squared uh, cubed. Sorry, it's per volume. Um, and so, you know, what what's a GeV? A giga electron volt. And so you say, well, that's an energy measurement. But in uh, particle physics land, energy and mass, we kind of think of as the same thing. And so, and that makes sense. E equals mc squared. Energy, mass, you know, they're the same thing. And c is a constant. And Actually, and you'll learn if you go and down the particle physics path that eventually we just, when we do all of our math, we just say that C is 1. So, right, so we just set C equal to 1. So we scale everything such that C is 1. So, but C is actually 3 times 78 meters per second, but we kind of make up different new units. And so you'll hear people say GEV, and they're actually talking about a mass. Um, anywho, so a, a GEV... Uh, I guess if I wanted to be absolutely correct about it, a, a GeV per C squared is the rest mass energy of a proton. So you can think of a GeV as the mass of a proton. And so if we've got our energy density is 0.4 GeV per centimeter cubed, then we can figure out our number density assuming a certain mass for the dark matter particle. So let's say the dark matter particle is 1 GeV which would actually be pretty light for a wimp, by the way. We expect wimps to maybe be like 100 GeV, but, or maybe even up to, um, you know, a thousand times more than that. But anyway, let's just pretend it's 1 GeV, because that'll make it easy. So then now the number density is 0.4 particles per centimeter cubed. That's not very much. So I'm assuming that you guys have all heard about, you guys know Avogadro's number? Yeah. Yeah. So, you, so how many like water atoms are in a gram per centimeter cubed little, like yeah, how many how many water water particles are in a gram of water? <laughs> yeah, it's just Avogadro's number. Yeah, I picked water. I was trying to help you guys out here because the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed. Um, <laughs> and actually, so a lot of the uh, physicists will put a lot of things in terms of like water units because of the the density of water is, is just such a, a common um, just like the one gram per centimeter cubed. Okay, so anyway, so the number of particles of water in like a gram, you know, is 10 to the 23. That's huge. So that means that the number of like maybe water particles versus dark matter particles here at Earth is like 10 to the 24 difference. And so I mean, I don't even know if you could wrap your head around that number. Um, a million is 10 to the 6. A billion is 10 to the 9. A trillion is 10 to the 12. And so that, I guess that means that a 10 to the 24 is a trillion trillion. Uh, so there are a trillion trillion more maybe like water atoms than dark matter particles. Uh, so yeah, anyway, long story short, there's really not that much dark matter around us. Uh, we think that there's a large, it's, it's very, it's very dispersed. Um, you know, it doesn't clump into these tight things like planets. It's really more, you think of more of it like a cloud. Um, you know, it's, it's not very dense. Um, so yeah, so it doesn't really affect Earth all that much, although we do have very sensitive detectors 
that should be able to see a signal even though there's not that many wimps around because they're really, really sensitive. They're underground, so they're shielded from a lot of things, and they just sit and they're really quiet, and they just sit and listen for you know a few events a year. Uh, and so far, they haven't really seen anything, but they're, we're going to get a next generation of experiments um, over the next couple of years that are going to push the sensitivity down uh, by another factor of 10. So that'll be really good. Maybe we'll see something. So that really seems like those particles are really elusive. Like you're not going to really easily find those. And it's going to take an unbelievable detection level to be able to understand that they're there at all. Right, exactly. And that's it, what is dark matter? is one of the top questions these days. And the person who, or the experiment who figures that out, I guarantee you is going to get a Nobel Prize, like the Higgs experiment did. Uh, it'll be the discovery of the century. So it's a really exciting field to work in. Well, that was a great question. <laughs> what, who's next? Um, where is the closest identified dark matter to Earth? Yeah, so like I said, it's all around us. Um, not very much, but I think like the biggest clump of it would be in the galactic center. So we expect dark matter to, you know, it's, it's pretty dispersed, but it does have, um, it's, uh, I'm going to use physics jargon, it's centrally contracted, and so there's a lot of it in the middle, and then it, it spreads out as you get further away from the middle, um, which is kind of what we see the stars doing in our galaxy, right? You think of a picture of a galaxy, the center of it's very bright and dense with all these stars, and then there's less of them as you go out. Um, and so the galactic center is eight kiloparsecs away. So kiloparsecs is a fancy astronomy distance. Um, one parsec is about three light years. And so eight kiloparsecs is 8,000 parsecs. So the galactic center is roughly 24, 25,000 light years away. Uh, so that's pretty far. <laughs> I, I don't know what that is in miles. I could do. You, That'll be a fun exercise for you. You all can try to convert that into miles, um, look up the conversion. Uh, but yeah, we if, if we're going to see a dark matter signal from the galaxy, um, or just even from space, we expect it to be the strongest coming from the galactic center. Uh, but even that's pretty far away. So again, really hard to detect. <laughs> so, next. What is the difference between dark matter and a black hole? <laughs> we, we've seen black holes. <laughs> yeah, we, we know black holes definitely exist. Um, and yeah, actually, there. So there are theories that say that your missing gravity could be not from a particle, but just because our theory of gravity doesn't work on huge cosmological scales and so maybe we just need to modify our, our theory of gravity and that will take care of everything we don't need to invent a new particle. Um, so anyway just kind of side note is that we you know dark matter as a particle is a theory and it's a pretty strongly motivated theory but it's not the only one uh, and there's a lot of options out there for what it can be uh, including just maybe our theory of gravity needs a little work uh, needs some tweaking. So black holes um, yeah, black holes are going to be much denser than dark matter. Like much, 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 much denser than dark matter. Um, and so this is where you get, uh, you know, tons. So the masses of, dark, of black holes can vary. Um, people will talk about supermassive black holes um, or smaller ones. Um, and what it is is all, so if you think of this like distortion of space time, uh, from the massive object, the like black hole is pretty much like putting the heaviest thing you can think of on a trampoline so that everything just kind of all falls down into this, you know, big deep um, pocket uh, distortion of space time. And so it's, you know, so dense, there's so much gravity there um, that not even light can escape from a black hole. Um, and there's one in the center of our galaxy. Uh, Call it in the direction of what we say Sagittarius A star. Uh, so Sagittarius is a constellation. So the constellation Sagittarius is pretty much right around the galactic center, uh, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And so there's a black hole there. Uh, we can see things interacting as they're kind of circling around the black hole before they've fallen in. We can see it um, 
radiating from Hawking radiation. Uh, so, so yeah, so let's see, big differences between dark, dark matter and black holes. Uh, densities are way different. Uh, we've actually seen black holes, uh, and I'd want to say that those, oh, and also black holes are maybe more localized, like they're kind of in one point in space, whereas the dark matter is a little bit more spread out. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all I got for that. Are they working on any other telescopes to focus better on gamma rays? Yeah. Yeah, I got lots of uh, next generation. The, the Russians are working on another space-based gamma ray detector called Gamma 400. Uh, I don't know too much about it, but I think it's, you know, they're, they're working on it, and maybe in a couple of years they'll get to do a launch. Uh, the next generation experiment that I work on here at SLAC is called CTA, which stands for Trenkov Telescope Array. So this is not a space-based mission. This is so when gamma rays hit the atmosphere, they immediately interact with the stuff in the atmosphere, and make this big shower uh, of particles as they lose energy in the atmosphere, and then these particles emit a very distinct uh, radiation, or they emit a very distinct blue light called Trenkov radiation. So if you've ever wondered why Dr. Manhattan in like uh, the Watchmen is blue, I'm pretty sure he's blue because of Trenkov radiation. You, you see this in nuclear reactors. It's this kind of uh, this blue glow that happens when you get particles moving really, 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 really fast through the air or through water. They make this Trenkov radiation that that's blue. So when the gamma rays hit. So then you ask yourself, well, then why isn't the sky, well, of course, it's blue from the Rayleigh scattering in the atmosphere, but why don't I see these blue flashes from all the gamma rays hitting? And these flashes are not very bright, and they're happening really, really, really fast. You know, they're happening maybe, uh, let's see, 10 to the 6, maybe. I mean, it depends on the energy, but let's say a million of these go on a second. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, so we can't see, that, see this blue light with our eyes, but we can make these telescopes that can have a really fast uh, shutter or a fast trigger rate, so they can uh, be sensitive to these really, really quick signals. And they are optimized for this blue light, and so that's the, tr that's the C, the Trenkov Telescope Array, would be an array of telescopes looking to collect this blue light from the gamma ray shower in the atmosphere. And right now, there are some uh, experiments that are doing this already. One's called HESS, which is in uh, Nvidia, Africa. And another one is Veritas, uh, which is in the US, I think. I forget exactly where. Maybe Arizona. But anyway, so that's also an array. And what, what they have right now are four telescopes. Although HESS has a fifth one in the middle. Um, and they, for CTA, we're going to just like make a super array. So we're not just going to have four telescopes. We're going to, well, we're not even just going to have one type of telescope. We're going to have three types of telescope. We're going to have small, medium, and large. So the small ones will be good for high energy events, and then the, or I'm sorry, yeah, the small ones will be good for higher energies. The larger ones will be good for lower energies, because lower energies are going to be dimmer, so we need a bigger telescope to collect all that light to be sensitive to it. And uh, just how many telescopes we're going to have in the array is still kind of being decided. We haven't even picked a spot where we want to build it yet. But uh, for the U.S., this is an international project. Um, mostly the European uh, scientists and the U.S. is hopefully going to be involved in a significant way. But the U.S. people, we're working on a kind of a new uh, way of making the telescopes and um, a new way of making the camera. And that's something we work on here at Slack is we're testing the uh, what they call the front end electronics for the camera. So like the very beginning of the telescope where the light's going to hit your light detector and then that signal is going to go through all these different chips and it's going to get read, it, read out and figuring out how you want to trigger to decide is the event interesting or not and how you're going to store all that data. Uh, that's what we're working on here at Slack. And it's, it's really cool. I, I like doing this experiment because I actually get to work in a lab with uh, actual equipment that I can hold in my hand as opposed to like the Fermi analysis, I, I do a lot of work on my computer. Um, so it's, it's good to get some, some hardware experience. And I'm learning a lot uh, about electronics, which I did not know before. <laughs> Learn as you go. That's a, that's a lot of being a physicist is being learning, yeah, being okay with having to learn new things and learning them pretty quickly and asking lots of questions. Because, yeah, you're always going to have to be learning new things. Andrea, is the Fermi the only telescope out there now of that 
capacity or are there others that in other countries that match? So there are other things that will look in different um, wavelengths of light, right? So we have different radio or optical, so like the Hubble Space Telescope is optical. Um, as far as gamma rays, for Fermi is the only one in the energy range that we're looking in. Um, the the ground-based arrays, like Veritas and Hess, they need to have the, ener the event be bright enough to be able to see, and so they can only they can only see very energetic gamma rays, and Fermi can see kind of the less energetic gamma rays since it's in space and it's detecting them in a different way. Um, there are lots of other things up there in space. Uh, for example, there's a detector called AMS, which I forget what it's, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer maybe. Uh, Sam Tang is going to be mad at me. Anyway, uh, so AMS is basically the LHC in space. Uh, so the LHC, or yeah, or CMS in space, I guess you could say. CMS is one of the detectors at the LHC. I know we have lots of acronyms. So Large Hadron Collider, Proton Smasher in Switzerland, there are these two main detectors that look at the results of the collisions called CMS and ATLAS. And so the space-based version of those is called AMS, and that's on the space station, and that's looking for protons, electrons, nuclei, you know, not just one particle. AMS is looking at all of the particles that are hitting it in space and trying to understand it, uh, what's going on. And they're about the same ish energy ranges for me. Uh, so their results are very interesting interesting to us. Um, yeah, I guess another fun fun story. Uh, so space is actually, well, it's not too crowded, but it is kind of crowded. Um, the number of satellites that are up orbiting Earth, uh, you know, there's a lot of them. And we did have to take a, we did have to make an emergency avoidance maneuver with Fermi uh, I think two years ago. So, two, so NASA people, they know, they've got some tr space traffic control people who know where everything is and they know all their trajectories. And they said, okay, well, Fermi, there's going to be this uh, Russian satellite that's out of, that, out of commission. It's just they're orbiting and you can't do anything to it. Uh, and its path's going to go like this and Fermi's path's going to go like this and they're going to be both in that collision point within like a millisecond of each other, or maybe a 10 milliseconds of each other. So, you know, the chances of them actually colliding are pretty high. You might consider doing something about that. Uh, and so our project scientist, Julie uh, McEntry, uh, poor Julie, I think that was a very stressful couple days for her because she had to decide what to do. And what we ended up doing is we do have a little bit of fuel on board and we could release it and shoot some fuel out in one direction. Of course, conservation momentum would shoot Fermi out in the other direction. And so we just sort of pushed Fermi a little bit so that we reached the, the intersection point before the Russian satellite. Uh, we avoided a collision. But you have to think, we had never used the fuel before. And if you open it up and it doesn't close, Fermi's over. That's it. Game over. And so you kind of have to weigh the options, um, you know, which which is the least probable bad thing that could happen. And Julie ended up deciding, or the mission ended up deciding to go with this maneuver, and it everything worked flawlessly, exactly as planned, and it was really so Fermi's still going. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, but there you go. You get a fun story. <laughs> that was great. That's a great story. Kind of scary. They showed a... Uh, satellite image the other day on, on television, I believe it was, of all the space junk. And it looks like it's quite, quite busy up there. There was a lot of stuff they said that they would like to just kind of go out and clean it up if they could. All right, I mean, that's kind of the central theme of Gravity, right? The movie? <laughs> Yeah, actually, when I heard the, the plot, of, I haven't seen it yet, uh, but when someone was telling the plot, I was like, ah, oh, it's just like with Fermi and that Russian satellite that we almost hit. Um. <laughs> there you go. I haven't seen it yet either, but I'll yeah. watch it. Next question, guys? Is space infinite? How do we know? Right. Uh, as far as we know, space is at least <laughs> 3.7 billion light years in radius. So we can, we can only see our observable universe. Um, you know, there, light can only travel so fast, and it can't, as far as we know, nothing can travel faster than that. And so we, we think that the universe's age is 
ish. It changes every once in a while, but around we'll just say around 13 billion years. And so that means that light, the furthest light that we could see would be 13 billion light years. Because if the light was 15 billion light years away, it would not have had enough time to reach us. And so we do talk about the observable universe. And is and as far as we can tell, the observable universe just keeps growing into, I guess, the non-observable universe. And is the non-observable universe infinite? I don't know if we could ever tell that. Uh, but as far as we know, I guess it is. Um, and yeah, I, I don't even know if we'd ever be able to see like the observable universe run into an edge or something. I don't even know what that would look like. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question, and as far as I know, I don't, I don't think we can tell if it's infinite or not, um, but that's not to say that someone clever is going to come up with an interesting way to probe that. There you go. That, that's all I got with that one. Things to solve. <laughs> yeah. All right, so do you think time travel is possible? Yeah, so um, the... Uh, the other class on Monday, we did a little test run on Monday, asked the same question, and I will give my stock answer, uh, which is, we are traveling through time right now at a rate of one second per second. Uh, but I, I get your point. People usually roll their eyes. Like, no, I, so is there time travel beyond that that uh, is possible? And definitely. Uh, so Einstein came up with this brilliant theory called special relativity, where, again, we've got space and time are mixed, and so one way to maybe think about it is the faster you, so, so the bottom line for something called time dilation is that moving clocks run slow. And so the way I think about it is the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. And so a, an example of this is something called the twin paradox. Uh, and you know, this, this hasn't been tested on the scale that I'm going to describe it, but this has been tested um, using airplanes and it has been measured. Um, the effect on for an airplane is maybe a difference is a nanosecond, not years like I'm about to talk about. Um, but this definitely is real. We observe it many, many times. Um, so the twin paradox is let's take this time dilation to, its, to one of its extremes and we've got two twins. Uh, and let's say they're both 30 or 25 years old. Let's do 25. So the 25 years old and twin A for astronaut, twin A decides he's going to be an astronaut and he's going to go trap. Oh, wait. Okay, I might be back. Sorry, I think this is a, a feature. I think this is a feature maybe of the wireless. Oh, I went away again. Am I back? You're back. We see you. Okay, great. All right. So yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, inter intermission's over. So we've got twin A. Astronaut decides he wants to go to, say, Alpha Centauri, uh, which is four light years away, and he's going to travel near the speed of light to get there. So we have new technology that lets us do that, which we don't right now. And twin B decides to stay here on Earth. <laughs> In my head, twin B, uh, <laughs> the first viewer that came to mind was boring because he doesn't want to go into space. Uh, so, <laughs> so the boring twin stays on Earth, and the astronaut twin goes to Alpha Centauri, and comes back the whole time traveling near the speed of light. So for the um, astronaut twin, let's say the trip took 10 years. So if you were traveling the speed of light, it would have been four years there, four years back. But let's say it was just a little bit under, and let's say it was 10 years. Um, and so he has he's now 35 years old. Now his other twin, his boring twin that stayed on the Earth, was not traveling that fast, and is in fact, his clock has been running faster, so he has experienced more time, and he is now, say, 50 years old. Um, and actually, given that I've now said it took 10, 10 years, I should be able to figure it out, but I'd have to look up the equation. Um, but anyway, the idea is that the Earth-based the, the Earth twin is older than the astronaut-based twin, because the astronaut twin was traveling close to the speed of light. And so if you want to think of it as like the astronaut twin has managed to go, and everyone on Earth has experienced 50 years, while the astronaut twin has only experienced 10. And so the astronaut twin, to some level, has gone forward in time. 
if you want to think of it that way. Uh, even and he's managed to go further in time on Earth than he experienced, and so that, in, in my opinion, that's that's a form of time travel. And so then you say, okay, so it looks like you can go forward in time, can you ever go backwards in time? And I, I cannot think of a way to make that possible. Um, but but that's not to say that um, someone else won't come up with something clever in the future. Yeah. Okay. Are there any known planets that could sustain life besides Earth? Ah, good. Besides Earth. Ah, uh, clever. So, I think Curiosity, uh, this this uh, detector rover on Mars. Um, I think I thought I saw an article saying they found evidence that there might have been water back in the day in Mars. So maybe at some point Mars could have. Uh, sustained life, but that's something we're investigating right now, uh, and that's hopefully something Curiosity will be able to help uh, give some evidence towards finding an answer. Uh, maybe another place in the solar system that uh, is a good target for, we say life as we know it, so maybe life is, you know, we, we, we have like what we are like and what animals and plants are like, but you know, life might be more um, diverse than that, and so you always have to be prepared for something that you didn't expect. Um, but for life as we know it, there's a moon orbiting Jupiter called Europa, and Europa is on the outside, the surface, it's just a sheet of ice, but since Jupiter is so massive and Europa is pretty close to it, uh, Jupiter's gravity is always kind of like squeezing Europa a little bit, so it's like if you get a stress ball and you squeeze it a lot, it heats it up, right? And so we think that Europa might actually have water underneath the ice from what we call tidal heating. And I, you know, every once in a while I hear of plans to make a detector to go to Europa to drill in the ice and see if we can find any uh, signs of life. Um, but as far as I know, nothing has really been definitely funded uh, and scheduled to go. But inside the solar system, I think that's a really good place to look. Um, outside the solar system, that's something we're still investigating. You know, we're still learning about extrasolar planets, and so we just had a mission, Kepler, that found I think something like 700 new extrasolar planets, and so we're still just kind of getting a census of, you know, what are what are their properties, what are their sizes, how far are they from their stars, um, are they bright, are they dim, it, you know, um, and I have a friend, uh, Ilsa Cleves, who is at Michigan, and she is she studies kind of the chemistry. So she's had to learn a lot of chemistry um, for this project, but she kind of studies the chemistry that we would expect in um, very young uh, planetary systems. So you know, the solar system is pretty old, right? We've been with the sun's been around, the Earth's been around for millions and millions of years, billions of years. Yeah, so she's she's thinking about and she's studying so we can detect these these protoplanet systems and she's trying to figure out what what kind of molecules existed there and how did they interact and um, does is the chemistry there maybe something that could sustain life or not what chemistry is needed to sustain life or not and so you can almost imagine doing this like astrochemistry uh, to sort of try to answer this question. How can you tell you are looking at a different universe? Yeah, I guess I, um, could you ask the question in a different way? I don't, I don't, what do you mean by a different universe? Different solar system. Yeah. Ah, okay, very good. Yeah, so usually when we talk about the universe, like, I don't think we've seen a different universe. Um, but yeah, so basically it seems like what you're boiling it down to is how can we tell how far away something is? Which is a really, really good question because you think you look at the stars, like how can you tell how far away they are? Because you only really get like this 2D projection of this three-dimensional um, space, and that's really difficult. And so we can do some fancy uh, geometry for very nearby stars, where if you um, detect them during one point in Earth's orbit and then another point in Earth's orbit, their angular Dist or where they are angularly in the sky is going to change just a little bit, and then you can how much it changes by tells you um, tells you how far away they are. 
Uh, you can also do something called a redshift measurement. And so you've learned about, um, do you guys know about like the Balmer lines? Does that mean anything? Very little. Very little. Okay, so um, you're going to learn about the hydrogen atom. Oh, did I go away again? No. No? Okay, weird. My computer's being weird. Okay, so you're going to learn about the hydrogen atom. And as the electrons move up and down in these different energy steps, as they go down in energy, they have to give off a piece of light. And since the energy steps are uh, discrete, so they're, they're, they're set sizes, the light that they emit whenever they go from step three to, say, one is always the same. And so these are called um, emission lines. We see them from the sun. And the, the lines, you know, what photon, what color or energy the lines occur at is different for every atom. Uh, they even see some lines from molecules. And so you can say, well, I know that the universe is expanding and that light is trapped on that space time. And so you can think of you put your light and it's traveling towards you, but as it's traveling towards you, space is expanding. And so what that's doing is it is pulling out, so you think of your light as a wave, so it's got a wavelength, and you're stretching out that wavelength as it travels to us. And so the wavelength's going to get a little bit longer as it travels across the universe and the universe is expanding before it reaches us. And so we say, okay, we know that that line should have been at whatever energy, but we actually observe it at this different energy. And what that difference is tells us how much the wavelength was stretched out and it tells us how far away it came from. And so that's called a redshift measurement. Um, and you can also play some, some games where you say, uh, where you use something called a standard candle where you say, okay, this is this kind of, this special kind of star, or this special kind of group of stars, and I know that they should all be shining this bright on average, but I see them as a little bit dimmer because they're far away. And so then I can say, well, based on how, how much I expect them to be able to shine versus how much I observe them shining, that tells me about their distance. Uh, but then, of course, that begs the question, you know, are you correct? Are they, you know, is your, is the intrinsic, is, is the, you know, true brightness you're assuming they started at, is that correct? How much do you trust that? Because if that theory isn't right, then your distance measurement's going to be wrong. Uh, so standard candles is a tricky business, but yeah, measuring distances uh, from the universe is very hard. Which is how I'm interpreting that question. Uh, was there something else that you had in mind? Nope, that answered it. Anybody else? Do you work on any classified material? No, I I, I didn't I didn't have to get any some any kind of like security clearance. Um, no, I don't. And actually, Fermi data is all public. Uh, you all could go to the Fermi Space Science or the Fermi Science Support Center, the FSSC. Uh, probably like NASA.FSSC.gov or something like that. You can download Fermi data, and you can analyze it to your heart's content. Um, so, yeah, Fermi is very, we're very much an open book. Um, I know Slack here, we're, you know, we're very, um, we're very careful and safety is, an, is important and so maybe the like one hazardous material that I've worked with is solder. So solder is this um, metal that you don't have to get it very hot for it to melt and then so you can melt it and like uh, it's like tape. It's like metallic tape that you can use to, to stick things together so you can melt it a little bit and then move it around like a hot glue gun and then you take the heat off and it you know, solidifies again. But the solder has some lead in it so it's technically a hazardous material and I know we had some extra solder in our lab and we had to call the hazardous material guys to get rid of it for us which you think, anyways like jewelry makers use solder I think all the time and you might think that's a silly hazardous material, but, but it is, and we had to go through a special protocol to, to get rid of it and dispose of it properly. Um, so I think it's good that, that we're that conscious of our impact on the environment and making sure that everyone's safe uh, here at Slack. But yeah, no, I, I don't really work on any classified material. Alright, um, why is the particle accelerator two miles long? Yeah, so this, uh, and I don't really work on the accelerator all that much, so it's, it's outside my area of expertise, but I can tell you as I understand it. Um, it's a linear accelerator, so you have like your starting point and then your end point, your target, there we go, that's going to hit. And so you can imagine if like you're accelerating, 
you, the longer you can accelerate, the higher energy you're going to get to. Or like if you're in a car and you're going on a straight track, you know, the, the longer the track is, the faster you're going to get up to. And so I think that that is probably what's why it needs to be so long. Is if you want to get things up to a certain energy, you need to accelerate them for a pretty long distance. And then once these things are going really fast, you know, near the speed of light, two miles is like a blink of the eye. You know, the, that's over with very quickly. And so you could take something like the Large Hadron Collider where they accelerate things in a circle so that they can, they have a continuous track so they can go around the circle many, many times and keep giving it little boosts to accelerate it up to an even higher energy than we can here at Slack. Um, the cost though is that whenever you have a charged particle like a proton or an electron and you move it around in a circle, it loses energy because as moving it around, forcing it to stay in a circle you have to make it, it loses energy. It's accelerating. It has a centripetal force, so it has an acceleration. And then when charged particles accelerate, they sh they give off light and they lose energy. So you kind of have this thing with the linear accelerator. You don't lose as much energy as you would in a circular accelerator. And so you you kind of have to tell, ask yourself, you know, do I want a continuous track? How much energy am I going to? And protons are heavier, so they don't lose as much energy going around in a circle as an electron would, which is what we accelerate here at Slack with the linear accelerator. Um, so there's kind of like these two competing energy, like you want it to be as long as possible to crank up the energy, but then if you're uh, going around in a circle, you're going to lose energy, so you're sort of weighing two different, uh, two different effects and trying to optimize. Yeah, and then Kat, I think Kat was saying when we watched the other video that the x-rays that she was looking at needed to be all the way up at that energy level for her to be able to see them again. Right. Exactly. Yeah, once you get to different energies, you can start to look at different things. And so, yeah, you, you want to get up pretty high. Any other questions, Jeff? Mm -hmm. That's it. We're done? Yeah, I believe so. Anything that came up while you were listening? And it doesn't have to be science-related, or it, it can just be about, like, academia or... Jazzercise. Or. In Nepal next week. Yes. She's not going to tell us about her vacation. She's going to Kathmandu. Yep. Yeah, I've been telling all my colleagues that I have very limited internet access there, so they can't email me. Even if they want me to do something, I'm not going to respond. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going off the grid. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a yep. good thing. Yeah. You yeah. take lots of pictures. I will, yeah. I'm really excited. We leave on Saturday, so I've got to... Sounds very exciting. Yep. I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably not jealous of the 20 hour plane ride plus no, the jealous. five hour plane ride. No, I'm not jealous of that at all. I yeah. <laughs> but I think the planes now, um, the one we're taking is going to have electricity sockets on our seats. So we'll have uh, so the computer. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have the computer, and I think we uh, got a new game for the computer, the new. South Park game, Stick of Truth, so we'll we'll play that on the on the play. Uh, yeah. Guys, anything? Uh, actually, um, if the stars are so far away, then why is it that um, the light in all around Earth uh, affects the ability to see them? So by the light around Earth. Um, are you talking about like atmospheric distortion? So we have this issue where, yeah, the, the, the stars are really far away, but the light, and the light is traveling, it's doing its thing, not much is happening, and then it hits Earth and it hits our atmosphere and it starts to interact with the stuff in the atmosphere and it gets jiggled around, and so it's harder to say exactly where the light came from. So um, our spatial precision for like a ground-based telescope is limited by the fact that the light gets bounced around in the atmosphere. And then of course we have our own star, the Sun, which is incredibly bright, you know, it just like outshines everything, so that's why you have to, you know, look at things at night um, or have some way to shield the Sun in order to detect it. Um, was that what you were asking? Stars, we see still there. Or Wait, one more time. 
He wants to know if the stars that we see are still there or if the light is just getting here. Right. So most of the stars that you see are going to be coming from inside the Milky Way galaxy. So if there may be some other galaxies, although I don't know if it, there's a few you can see with the naked eye, but you know you wouldn't see individual stars there. You kind of see them as a galaxy as a whole. So the stars that we're seeing are within the Milky Way galaxy. And so let's say, so Earth is kind of maybe, I guess it's not all the way on the edge. Maybe it's halfway out. Um, yeah, it's about halfway out. Because I think the, the whole Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years. And so the galactic center is 25,000 light years from us. So that's like a quarter. So we're about halfway up. OK, so let's just say like a star sh that we're seeing from the galactic center. So that means that the light that we're detecting now was admitted by the star 25,000 years ago. But on the life scale of a star, that's like a day. You know, like a star, stars live for billions of years. Our sun, I think, is supposed to live for um, 10 billion years. I forget, but let's just, just say like a bil billions of years, order of magnitude. Um, so the star, so the light that we're seeing from 25,000 years ago, that star is still shining. And it's still shining, so in 25,000 years, we, sh we should still be seeing light from it. Now, the, I guess the exception to that is if we're seeing a supernova. So supernova is this big burst of light that happens as a star dies. Uh, and so when we see that, then that means the star has died. Well, if we see that in the galactic center, that means the star has died 25,000 years ago. And we, But then after the supernova, there's a core um, of a white dwarf sometimes, which is also pretty bright. And we do see um, these things that are called supernova remnants. And so this is after the star has exploded, it bursts out all of this gas, and then there's this hot white dwarf in the center and it's still glowing a little bit and we can detect this. Um, the Crab Nebula is an example. You can look that up on Wikipedia. There's some beautiful pictures of it. Um, so even after the star has gone supernova, we can kind of still detect, you know, like the, the energy and the, the stuff doesn't go away. Energy is conserved. It just gets more spread out. Um, so I guess in some, in some sense the star never dies. It just becomes something new. Um, so, but, but yeah, like I said, the, the light from within, the, yeah, I know there's sometimes I see this thing that's like twinkle, twinkle, little star, I'm seeing you, but you're dead. I forget how the, the poem goes. Um, but it, most of the stars we're seeing are from the, the Milky Way galaxy. Pretty much all the stars we're seeing are from the Milky Way galaxy. And it's only, I think the furthest they could be from us are, say, 75,000 light years. So that's not that long ago for this in the star's life cycle. So... That's, that's uh, I think, a misconception. So what do we see, Andrea? When we see a falling star, what is it actually doing? Has it been, how does it get out of the gravitational force it was in? Well, OK, so I think what we would call a falling star or a shooting star is actually kind of a chunk of material um, from, say, a comet or a meteorite, just like some space dust. Uh, a big, maybe fist-sized chunk of it that hit our atmosphere, and our atmosphere is awesome at protecting us, and so it burns it up really fast, and that's what we see as the shooting star. So that's not really a star; it's just kind of a, a chunk of space junk. Um, and but there are stars, uh, and I, uh, high velocity stars. I think maybe is what they're, there's probably another name for it, but that's not my field of expertise. But these are stars that are traveling very fast compared to, you know, the rest of the stars in the galaxy that are gravitationally bound. And so people are thinking, like, what's going on? Like, why is this star suddenly, you know, going so quickly? And there are people who think about, well, maybe it was in some weird orbit, and then something else came and disturbed, disturbed that orbit, and it got slingshotted out. Uh, and now it's this kind of runaway star. Uh, but that's kind of a current area study. Um, I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but I, that made me think of that. Well, these guys have six minutes left before they have to go to their next class. So we kind of have to wrap this up. Uh, is there anything, okay. you guys, anything? Uh, How did you meet your husband? That's the question from all you guys. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, actually, so I, I went to grad school, and I decided I did not want to date my fellow physics grad students, because I did not want to mix my personal life with my professional life. Um, cause I, and to some degree, I, like, I didn't want to be known as 
so-and-so's girlfriend or so-and-so's ex-girlfriend. I wanted to be known as Andrea Albert, that girl who's doing awesome gamma ray science. <laughs> and so I really wanted to look outside of the, the department, and I realized I was only hanging out with physicists. And so I actually went on a website called OkCupid, okay which is a free online dating website because I'm cheap. And Dylan was on OkCupid, okay and that is, in fact, where we met. And then we, we went on a date in, in Ohio and just really hit it off, and you know, we've been together ever since. So. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it, I mean, the way that I think about it, just personally, is maybe there's a certain percentage. Uh, I, I don't believe in one soulmate. I think there's a certain percentage of you having high compatibility with one person, and so in some sense, it's a numbers game. And the more people that you can meet or you know get get exposed to, the higher your chances of finding that person that you're really compatible with is. And so with OK Cupid, I could look at a lot of different profiles and be like, oh, you know. It's cool that you think that, but I don't know if I really agree, so I don't think I'd want to date you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not very romantic. Um, it's actually quite scientific. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Science dating. Um, but yeah, it worked out for us. And he's not a scientist, which I love. He's a science enthusiast. Uh, he's a very, very smart guy. But, but I get to have a life that's not physics with him, and I like that. And go to Nepal. And go to Nepal, yeah. <laughs> Andrea, have a wonderful trip, and thank you so much for spending this time. Thank with you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you. And um, Mary knows, how, or Mrs. Hyde knows how to get in touch with me. So if anyone has any questions, you know, don't hesitate to send me an email. Uh, I'm, I'm happy. Great follow-up to this, so I'll let you know what we come up with. Okay, great. Well, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was nice talking with you. See you later. Bye, Bye. Bye-bye.